Thanks so much, Lakeisha, and uh, welcome to this uh, collaborative session on children and worship at the Religious Education Association Conference. Um, my name is Kathy Dawson, and I'm on the faculty of Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia, and also project director uh, for the Wonder of Worship Lilly Endowment Funded Initiative that will form a part of our presentation tonight. As some of you may know, uh, Lilly Endowment has recently expressed interest and in funding in the area of faith of children and families. Uh, the initiative that both the projects we're going to discuss tonight are affiliated with is the Nurturing Children Through Worship and Prayer Initiative. This particular initiative was an invitational grant that included both a planning phase and an implementation phase. Uh, we will be talking about both aspects tonight and hope to leave plenty of time for discussion around the, the wider topic of children and worship that undergirds both of these grants. So to begin with, I'd like to introduce my colleague from Candler School of Theology at Emory University, Dr. Kalia Williams, the Associate Dean of Worship and Spiritual Formation. Candler's project under this same grant initiative is titled the Sacred Arts Collective. And Dr. Williams, I'd like to turn it over to you for your presentation of what you've done during this last year of the planning grant phase. Thank you, Dr. Dawson, and good evening, everyone, or good evening for me, good morning for others, and good afternoon for some. It is um, wonderful to be with you all uh, on this evening and to share in what I am hoping is going to be a very, very good, fruitful conversation for us. Um, as Kathy shared, I also am a part of um, the initiative from Lilly Endowment that has really launched us here at Candler into an untapped area. And uh, it was one that as we started thinking about and entering into the planning phase, one that we realized we do um, strong focus on youth and young adults at Candler and uh, what we offer throughout our curriculum, but there hasn't been a whole lot in the area of children. And this was this area specifically looking at children's ministries um, for the children who are ages five through 12. And so in our planning phase of the Lilly Grant, the phase one, we entered in in a few ways. So the first thing that we did as we entered into the planning phase was one, to deepen my awareness of children's ministry and child theology. So I admittedly am not um, a children's ministry scholar. I am not, I, I focus on worship. Uh, and so it was very important to begin to broaden my awareness beyond me being a mother of two small children who are five and seven, um, but to think a little bit more um, about what it is that we are, are really looking at as we talk about nurturing children through worship and through prayer. And so that was the first phase of our planning was really building the library, doing the reading and um, assembling a team of individuals here at Candler that became um, listening partners for me. And we began to think about and brainstorm where we are going and what the focus of our grant would be. And out of that, we um, made a, we decided, I will say, that the focus of the grant, really what jumped out for me was being able to integrate all of my areas um, of deep passion and love. And so a part of that meant integrating the arts. So as Kathy shared, the title of our grant is the Sacred Art Collective. And so we really wanted to think about how do we imagine this idea of nurturing children through worship um, and, and the and integration of the arts as the catalyst of that um, nurturing children in worship. And so what we then did, and we are still, I will say not completely out of planning phase because there's still a little bit more in our phasing to go, but what we've done thus far is we've held several listening sessions. To date, we've held six listening sessions 
with children's ministry leaders across Atlanta. That then, um, to just kind of understand the breakdown, that is uh, 40 different congregations that have been in conversation. The individuals from those congregations have been specifically their children's ministry leader. If that is a clergy person, then it's been the clergy person. If it is a lay leader, then it's been the lay leader. And we've also then brought in their children, youth, and um, young adult ministry leader, to, who's also a partner in the leading of um, the children's ministry in some way or another. Now, with that uh, 40 congregations across Atlanta, that breakout looks like um, Presbyterian churches, African Methodist Episcopal churches, United Methodist churches, Baptist churches, non-denominational churches, um, and disciple, Christian Church Disciples of Christ. That's our, our makeup and the denominational um, or the ecclesial diversity that we have. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the questions that were asked. And But before I do that, I want to come back really quick because something that we did after holding the six sessions is we took a moment to pause and ask who was not in the conversation because we recognized that there was a number of individuals, a number of communities who were not in the congregation or who are not in the conversation. And so from that, we recognize that there was a, um, our international population was not in the conversation as, as much as we wanted them to be. And that really um, became a focus for us in what comes next in our remaining part of the planning session. And then it helps shape our intentionality as we move into the implementation of who we invite to be a part of the program in and of itself. But it was very important for us once we moved through the first six to say, okay, let's stop and see who were not invited in this conversation so that we are making sure that we broaden the dialogue that we have even in the planning phase. Something that we did decide very early on is we wanted in a, a focus in Atlanta. So that's the main part for the Sacred Arts Collective. It is focusing specifically on Atlanta congregations, and it will highlight as much as possible Candler alumni when we talk about our creative artists. So those are the two anchors that we are looking at making sure we hold true to as we move into the implementation phase. Um, so I'm going to go through very quickly just some of the things, some of the questions we asked and some of the things that we heard, and then I'll turn it back over to Kathy, and then I'll come back in a little bit and talk about, based on all of this, uh, where are we going with the actual implementation of the grant. So in our six conversations, we asked a few questions, and the first question started out, if you had no budget restrictions, what would be your dream for integrating children in worship? I saw a few smirks on faces here. Everyone loves that kind of dreaming, right? And it was actually wonderful. I, that's the way I like to hold these kinds of conversations is to start big and let's just hear no holds bar whatsoever. What is it that you would dream up as it related to children in worship as well as an integration of the arts. And these listening sessions were amazing. Um, and they were amazing on a few levels. Amazing for the content that we were able to receive, but also amazing in the connections that we saw made in the room every single time. So those are two parts that are very important. So content wise, we heard everything from the ability just to have the resources and the tools and the supplies to even think about an integration of the arts. We heard a lot of expanding the way I was even thinking about the creative arts and making sure that a part of this arts piece is including the digital arts. And so we were able to think through uh, what does it look like for children ages five through 12 to engage the digital arts world and how does that become a major part of um, being able to connect 
children into worship and making some intergenerational connections at the same time. So that was very important as well. The other pieces that we did here were um, very much the understanding or the feeling from these ministry leaders that most of them, I won't say all of them, but about 80% of them have their children's ministry worshiping in a separate space um, and having their own time and ability to worship and be together and to learn together. And so we talked a lot in all six of those sessions about the fruit of having their own space for children, but also what is at stake when we are only in our own spaces and we don't necessarily have the ability to come together, which is always the intergenerational connection um, is always top on that list. And so we talked a little bit about what would it look like then to not just have children say come into worship once a month or however often and just be present or to serve in ways that adults deem are the proper ways to serve but to really flip it and privilege the uh, voices of children to hear how they would like to show up in the space and to then begin to think about how do you worshipfully change, redesign what happens in a service to authentically integrate children in that time. That became the central focus of the implementation grant that we wrote um, right there, this understanding of privileging the voices of children in that time and in that space. So I'll talk a little bit more um, about what came out of it in a second. Uh, the other piece that I did want to highlight in the planning sessions was the fact that when you have children's ministry leaders from very different demographics throughout Atlanta in a room having conversation where they can just dream together and for some moments lament together and just be there it really became um, obvious that there is a lack of network or connection between children's ministry leaders across the city. There's a lot of operating in silos. There's some operating within kind of denominational connections, very little, but some. Uh, so there was a great desire to be able to just have an opportunity to continue those kinds of conversations in the type of settings that we had. And so those are the two main important areas that I will um, say that really came out of our planning session. I'm gonna pause here, because uh, I think my 10 minutes is up. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Kathy to share a little bit more about her planning grant phase. And then when I come back to talk about the implementation, I'll build a little bit more on what I found and the way it shaped out our grant. Right. Thank you so much, Kalia. I'm going to go ahead and share screen um, to uh, tell you a little bit, whoops, about what we're um, doing with the Wonder of Worship grant at Columbia, or WOW. So we have one of um, the members of our planning team who really likes to do uh, acronyms and alliterative things. So we are the WOW Project at uh, Columbia. The focus of our grant will be to both enhance the worship lives of the children already in our midst at Columbia as a freestanding seminary that has many families who live on or near campus and to partner with congregations around the United States and beyond who wish to enhance their worship for the inclusion of all ages and abilities. So already you're seeing that that the uh, Emory grant is more localized and ours is really broad. Um, I'm hoping that we can uh, find commonality within um, the various groups that will be working on this around the country. Um, so um, during our planning phase, I wanna highlight three things that we have done to prepare ourselves for this test. Uh, we've also done fo focus groups or listening sessions. Um, we've uh, developed a planning team for the implementation phase. And we've also attended as a planning team the Intergenerate Conference in Nashville, Tennessee that just happened last month. And we built that into our planning grant as well. 
So first, the focus groups. Um, we had very little time to recruit these, which Kalia can attest to as well, uh, that uh, we were notified in November that we had received the planning grant, and yet we had to get the implementation phase grant in by mid-January. So there wasn't, you know, with the holidays and everything, there wasn't a whole lot of time to recruit uh, folks for these uh, listening sessions and focus groups. So um, I had to rely on some of my existing contacts. So um, I administer the Hope for CE Facebook group of about 1,800 uh, educators from around the country and around the world, um, a lot of whom specialize in children and intergenerational ministry. So we drew on uh, that connection and also personal contacts that we had with other churches and individuals who uh, function um, in children's ministry within their congregations. So an, initially, um, we also did six focus groups so far in the planning stage, and we are also trying to expand the diversity and seeing who has been missing from these groups. Um, but initially, we started out with four groups in the planning phase before the implementation proposal went in and then did two in addition to that. And so we've had uh, so far a total of 38 participants. Um, these participants have been predominantly Presbyterian Church USA with 19, but we did have a smattering of Episcopalians, United Methodists, Lutherans, Baptists, Pentecostals, and non-denominational participants. Um, our congregations tended to be on the smaller side, uh, membership-wise. Um, rather than uh, larger congregations. We had 17 churches represented under uh, 100 members and 12 more that were under 250. We really wanted to spotlight uh, the importance of small membership churches in being able to implement intergenerational worship and also churches that um, likely didn't have the funds to hire a professional educator on their staff to, to work with children and uh, worship planning. And so uh, that's kind of our, our focus too. Um, the number of children in worship in these uh, total amount of churches ranged from five to 70, 70 being from our only church represented that had over a thousand members in it. Uh, those who responded initially were pro predominantly white North American female participants, but we did have one focus group with Nigerian educators, uh, both in Africa and in immigrant congregations in various other countries. Uh, participants were also predominantly lay educators or staff members in these churches, although we did have six clergy and four volunteers amongst our initial participants in these focus groups. Some of the questions that we asked, um, we were most interested in the changes that co the COVID pandemic had made on children's participation in worship. So we asked things about uh, changes that they had observed in children's ministry in the last um, few years. We were also interested in how children participated in worship and any leadership roles that they already engaged in. We wanted to know how often these uh, folks working with children had input into worship planning and how they resource families for worship participation and nurturing their children's prayer lives in church and at home. These focus groups were conducted mainly on Zoom and most were one hour in length. So um, some of the preliminary results that we have found so far in a, a read of some of the data was that uh, most churches are still um, having a set aside time during worship where the children come forward as kind of a separation of the children from the west, rest of the worshiping community. On, on an aside note, my own congregation that I worship in regularly has such a time but they invite not only children, but all those who are young at heart to come forward. And so we regularly have youth and, and adults who come every Sunday down um, for the worship, uh, for the children's moment as well. Um, 
we discovered that most of the educators and staff members have very little input into worship planning beyond uh, times when children are specifically invited into worship leadership. So they might have some input in a family service for Christmas Eve or a, a designated children's Sunday, but on a regular basis, they, they have very little input. And what they were hoping to see in our implementation phase were some of the, the resources we would be producing or um, events that we would be having would be targeting senior pastors and worship committee um, members who do have that power of worship planning to give them the tools they need to, to better incorporate children into the worship space. Uh, one unique learning that I hadn't really thought about until we started having these conversations um, was that the outdoor worship that occurred during the pandemic was really popular with families with young children and that they would like to see churches uh, going back to this, even though um, most have gone back into the sanctuary. Part of this was because the, these services need, tended to be less formal. Um, children had more of an opportunity to be children when they were outside than when they're um, sitting in a pew in the sanctuary. And there was less um, blowback from other church members who saw children as, as disruptive into the um, worship space. So it'll be interesting to see churches that embraced outdoor worship during the pandemic, if they at least periodically bring that form of worship back um, to include um, more of these uh, good outcomes of outdoor worship with families. Um, another thing we learned was that many of these churches had made strides towards intergenerational worship before the pandemic, but it was difficult um, to maintain those strides during online worship uh, during the pandemic. The focus turned more back to the uh, worship leadership, and so there was less incorporation of people of all ages into uh, worship leadership during that time. So in some instances, churches are having to start over with promoting intergenerational forms of worship now that they're back in sanctuaries. Uh, this piece uh, we're going to come back to in the discussion in just a little bit, but a lot of these folks um, in coming back after pandemic are striving for more engagement with children rather than entertaining them in the worship space. So, and they do this in a variety of ways. Some churches used that time of, of not being in the sanctuary to take out some pews up front and create prayer grounds for children to engage um, whatever is happening in worship uh, up front with various activities. Others created resources that could be put in the pews that were more helpful in helping children to fully engage in worship. Some um, developed uh, worship packs that were um, more about engaging in worship and less about giving children activities to do to entertain them while the worship service was going on. Um, but this is a, a commonality, common theme that we found from both of our projects that uh, there's this desire for more engagement with children and, um, you know, less of spotlighting them as performers or um, trying to entertain them to keep them busy during the worship service. Um, the other aspects of the planning grant for us uh, were the development of the planning team, and you see a, a Beautiful picture of all of us here at the Intergenerate Conference last month. Um, it was a real blessing to be able to take our folks um, to uh, Nashville for this, both as a community building for the planning team who are going to be working alongside me with um, our various complex initiatives that are going to come in the implementation phase. And it also gave us a common language um, and a common experience to talk about in relation to what we're hoping to accomplish with um, our partner churches within the implementation phase. 
Um, so that's all I really wanted to say about our planning phase. I'm going to turn it back over to Kalia um, to talk about uh, next steps, implementation. What are we going to do now that we have uh, this five years of money to spend on this particular topic? So. Which is everyone's, you know, hope and dream to have mm -hmm. money to just spend, right? Uh, so over the implementation phase, we will um, continue the or round out this year the planning phase that we started because, as I said, we uh, held listening sessions with children's ministry leaders, but there are also scheduled sessions. There will be three sessions that we will hold between August and October with children and their caregivers. And so that will be three opportunities that we will have to speak with a group of children and their caregivers. And then we will have in October, two sessions with creative artists. Um, and so that's gonna be the rounding out of all of our listening sessions and conversation um, pieces. But from the initial conversations that we held and a lot of our findings from the ministry leaders and some of the uh, one-off conversations that I was able to have with some of the children and, and more so caregivers that I know throughout the city, we developed the Sacred Arts Collective, which is really designed to um, develop partnerships with congregations. And so we're thinking of ourselves as partners with congregations, with children and with their caregivers, as well as with creative artists, really for us to support the congregations in dreaming up and thinking about how they can implement diverse worship practices that will integrate the arts to engage their children more intentionally um, in their worship life. And so through that, we really um, are basing the work of the Sacred Arts Collective on three core priorities. So the first priority for us is intentionally engaging and hearing from children. That has to be central for us. Um, it is really important to myself, it's important to our team, and it has been uh, well received in the understanding of um, children do have something to say about how they worship. And so let's privilege and really engage their voices and really put them at the center of the space of authority when we start to think about how we want to invite children to be uh, more engaged in our worship life. The second core priority for our project is to facilitate this intergenerational participation in the creative arts practice as a way to enhance the abilities of ministry leaders and caregivers to nurture children through the arts. This is important because we realize uh, we can talk about the arts and the arts are really great at, to witness, but not all of us adults are actually in the practice of it. So when we designed the, the Sacred Arts Collective, we have designed it to make sure that there will be several opportunities for the adults in the program to get themselves right involved next to children as they're engaging the arts. And if that's get down playing in the mud, then we're all gonna get down and we're gonna play in the mud together and we're gonna dream up. And so it's really this idea of getting very, very intentional about the intergenerational participation. And then our third priority is to develop networks for ministry leaders. As I said at the beginning, about how important it was. And I could see and feel the energy every single time we were able to get ministry leaders together um, just so that they could talk to one another because they've never seen each other or spoken together or had that kind of intentional time together. So we uh, definitely created an element in the Sacred Arts Collective to develop those networks for those ministry leaders to be able to engage in collaborative dialogue, to really just help enrich what their congregational ministries are doing and how they're thinking about their practice in worship with children. So from there, we have designed this to be um, a five-year program that we are planning to engage 30 congregations across three cohorts. So that will be 10, co cohort, 10 congregational teams per cohort 
Uh, and the cohorts will, will run annually and we will have three cohorts. So at the end of this, we will have 30 congregations who will journey through a year of a series of educational experiences. Um, the team in our first year, we are really gonna be in the setup of the program, recruiting those congregations and the creative partners who will help lead uh, some of the, the participation as well as um, thinking through our evaluation process and getting that set up also, because it's gonna be important for us to evaluate across the way. So what will these congregational cohorts actually do with us? Well, when a congregational cohort comes together, um, there will be a series of engagements that will begin in our second year. And so years two, three, and four of implementation, the cohorts will engage what we are calling sacred arts exploration. And this will be a series of opportunities throughout the year uh, for the congregational teams to have that in-depth exploration of creative and digital arts that will be led by expert consultants. So if it's photography that we are doing, then we're going to bring in an expert photographer who's worked with children before. And so that's the one piece to all of our creative arts experts, our, our experts who have worked with children to be able to bring in um, that exploration for the congregational teams. And so this exploration will include time for the artists and the teams to be in dialogue, for them to learn from one another as they really imagine more intentional integration of that particular art form within their worship service. There will also be time built in to try it out. And so practicing it and then coming back and being able to kind of keep the feedback loop to say, how did it work? Did it go great? Was it received well? Did it flop? Why did it flop? And just giving that support so that these congregational teams really aren't afraid to flop because they have a core team that's supporting them um, to, to help them say, it may not work for you, but at least we try it out. And I think that will be really great. Um, they will also have opportunities to go through worship planning and leadership training. And this worship planning and leadership training will be um, specifically designed to help ensure that the privileging of the perspective of children is still central in the space of worship planning. So how do you design worship with children in mind, not just with children in mind, with children at the table? in the conversation and, and being able to teach some of those best practices and how that will happen. And then we have the ministries leader, ministry leaders network. That's the collaborative piece that we will bring together that creates spaces and opportunities for the leaders to just develop a relational network um, of collaboration and support. And then each year we'll close out, the congregational cohort will close out with a professional development piece which will uh, bring members of each cohort in and it invites them to come in and to develop their own experience at, by sharing a little bit about what they've designed to deepen their own learning. They get to hear what others design, how the year's gone with them. And each year, every cohort gets invited. So by year three, all 30 congregations can be a part of it. And the final um, professional development that we'll do at the very close of the grant will will highlight the congregational cohorts um, by letting them kind of lead a lot of the discussions and that one will be open to the public to bring in other congregations that didn't have a chance to be a part of the Sacred Arts Collective but did have some interest and would like to know a little bit more about it. And then the part that really brings me a lot of joy is we have also designed the Sacred Arts Collective to offer congregational artists and residents grants. So upon the completion of a congregational team's cohort year, the Sacred Arts Collective will offer the congregations an opportunity to apply for an artist and resident grant for up to $20,000 to have an artist in residence for an identified period of time to work closely with their children's ministry, their worship teams, and within their congregation toward the inclusion of children in worship through the creative arts. This is the part that excites me because it's, it's one thing to kind of step away and learn it, 
and journey with a community who's doing the same thing. And then to come back into your own congregational context and think about implementation um, to be able to have an expert in the art side journey alongside with you as a true partner within that congregational setting for whatever the period of time is that is determined upon their grant application, I think will be such a value add to the congregational community. And it will allow such room for growth and flexibility as the entire community embraces um, a greater integration of the arts through their worship experience. And then finally, the other piece that we learned quite a bit in our listening sessions with ministries leaders was this uh, desire for some digital resource where they can go to think about planning and to think about how to, to integrate arts and just some type of resource. So we will develop a website and the website that gets developed will be just that. It is a digital resource that will um, it will unfold. What we're imagining right now is curating the resource um, content by project leadership's team. So by our team, the project leadership team, as well as our artists and residents, there will be videos that will have short snippets of how to think through a liturgical season and an inclusion of particular art um, to think through how do we carry forward what's happening in the congregation into the home to make that connection uh, a little bit more. And this will be a public facing um, website that will be open to anyone who wants to engage it. But a lot of the fruit from what we get, gather throughout our time together in the Sacred Arts Collective will then show up on the website as well as so much more as we plan out how how it will become a worship planning um, resource for children's ministry leaders. So Kathy, I will turn it back over to you to share a little bit about your implementation. Great. Okay. So um, our implementation grant will also cover the next five academic years at CTS, but I'm only going to take a look at uh, year one for the sake of time tonight, so we'll have some um, more discussion time. Uh, along the way, you'll hear things that we're planning for the long haul that will have their beginnings in this first year. Um, so we, we've got a guiding question that is informing us about how can Columbia Theological Seminary best partner with congregations in nurturing creative and inclusive worship with children. Um, we're really interested in inclusive worship for all ages that includes children as a part of the whole worshiping community and how we can build relationships between the generations as a part of this. Um, our grant activities throughout the five years will be divided between things that we do internally on the CTS campus to enhance the education of seminary students on this topic and become more intentional about nurturing the worship and prayer lives of the children who live on or near campus. Uh, the grant will also have an external focus where we work with partner congregations to assist them in making changes in their worship life that speak to this idea of intergenerational and all age worship. Uh, let's look specifically at what we'll try to accomplish this first year of the grant. So internally, we're poised to hire a project assistant at 20 hours a week to administratively assist with this grant and keep us on track. We have a designated room on campus for becoming a model godly play classroom to be used by community children, as well as a training facility for seminary students and interested partner churches in partnership with our regional trainer from godly play. Um, in year one, we will be mainly renovating the room and readying it for use with some trial sessions with on-campus children. Right now, our worship opportunities on campus are mainly held during the morning, so are unavailable to school-age children. Uh, we plan to expand these opportunities at other times available for children, including increased use of our wonderful children's library housed within the seminary library. And finally, for the internal side, we need to develop our website presence also and a logo so that we have a place 
to link and upload the various content uh, that we will use with our partner churches and seminary students on this topic. And it too will be a public facing site that anyone can access um, because we're also dealing with international populations. Uh, so having something that they can access uh, for free is uh, a hope for this project. Um, externally, we are doing a lot of recruitment this year. So this recruitment includes our partner congregations, writers for our monthly quick sheet idea pages, topical experts for our upcoming podcasts. Uh, so a lot of recruitment is happening this first year. Uh, we'll also be writing many contracts this first year with camp and conference centers for our biannual regional gatherings. We have hope to have uh, four regions designated. Uh, from our partner congregations where people can gather face to face around the topics that will be covered in the podcasts and that they will come back with hands on things that they can take back to their congregations. Um, we'll also be writing contracts with video editors for uh, we're hoping to do a series of best practices videos uh, that can be posted on the website for others to use and access. Um, we'll continue our focus group research to diversify our pool of participants. We have to do, hope to do uh, as many focus groups as we've already done, so six more of those. And in spring 2024, during my sabbatical semester, I'm hoping to do qualitative research directly with children around their views and knowledge of worship within some of our partner congregations so that we have the voice and agency of children also in our planning. We'll also be interpreting the, the data that we've already accumulated to share with others in the form of posts, publications, and an audit sheet that congregations can use to enhance worship for all. Towards the end of this academic year, we'll be promoting and accepting applications for quick wins grants for $1,000 each that can help congregations to make some immediate changes requiring little time and money to their current practice. Uh, we're also hoping that these grants build enthusiasm and interest for the project as a whole. Uh, further down the road, um, a couple of years from now, we'll be doing a phase two grant for larger amounts of money for congregations to um, make uh, more substantive changes in the way that they're doing worship. Finally, one aspect of the grant that um, Hope for CE Steering Committee will take on immediately for this year will be biannual children's ministry online Sabbaths occurring after Christmas and after Easter each year that will allow those working with children to have a space to worship themselves um, in an online environment and to process the busy seasons of the church year that have just passed. Um, so that's what we have ahead of us for the first year of the implementation grants. And um, we are happy to answer any questions that you have about either of these respective grants, but we wanted to begin this discussion time with a more general question on this topic of children in worship that both of our grants share, which is how do you see this movement from entertainment of children during worship to engagement of all participants. So that is where we are. And I would open it up to anyone who would like to address that question um, or speak generally about your own impressions of children in worship. Norma? I really appreciate including children and youth in the planning. Uh, it is indeed not a matter of entertaining children or keeping them busy while other people worship, but to be participants, uh, to usher, to, to do drama for the sermon, to, to read lessons, to sing with, to create prayers and to pray them, to read lessons. Uh, all of that is, is part of uh, children and youth being the worshiping community with people of all ages. Mm -hmm. There's a young a man who just turned 60 who remembers when he was 10 saying, I wanted to do worship. I didn't just want to be there. Mm -hmm. And um, 
he still remembers that and participates in worship today. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. That's right up what we're thinking. So thank you so much for those words. Anyone else have things you want to talk about, about children's engagement in worship? Uh, Elizabeth, you unmuted. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, it, it's just so exciting to hear that this has been um, reclaimed again. Um, back in the, uh, the late 70s, uh, early 80s, in the Uniting Church in Australia, uh, Dr. David Merritt uh, from the Joint Board of Christian Education and the staff uh, of that uh, publishing company that published curriculum materials uh, for our Methodist Presbyterian Congregational, uh, some Churches of Christ uh, and some Anglicans, um, we would uh, every or about twice a, a, a term, probably about six or eight times in the year, there were intergenerational worship activities. So uh, the, the Sunday school and the uh, the worship time were integrated and doing just the sorts of things that you were wanting. The resistance came from the adults who didn't like their worship being turned into um, their words Sunday school uh, and failed to appreciate um, just all of those uh, things that that later became part of godly play and uh, and the ways in which we integrate. So I'm thrilled to hear what you're doing. Um, it's really great, and and I hope that we we can uh, again empower children. It reminds me. I, back in the, the 70s, uh, used to lead camps and, and attended camps, summer camps or holiday camps for us. It wasn't just summer camps. And the children in the teams provided the worship. You know, we were we were doing, enacting the Bible readings, et cetera, as Norma has said. And, um, and there was a lot more agency and production. And it was hard when the kids went home to their churches and didn't get to do all of those fun activities. The last thing I want to say is, well, you know, would you believe uh, this coming Sunday uh, where the uh, lectionary says uh, it's the parable of the uh, the sower or the parable of the soils, however you like to call it. Um, um, we're going to do uh, cafe church breakfast uh, out in the morning tea area. And so we'll integrate morning tea, calling it breakfast, uh, with with the worship time. Um, it's an experiment for this little congregation, um, uh, but it's it's using all my Christian education uh, expertise and you've just stimulated me to uh, some more activities uh, that might be included in that program and I'm, I'm happy to um, send off what I'm planning uh, to anyone who's interested, but it's 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 doing that kind of thing. And, and I hadn't realized that outdoor worship um, done during the pandemic because we didn't do it. We were closed mm. um, by, by decree. Um, anyway, thank you for listening. Blessings on your work. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I, I think you really are pointing to um, finding those other spaces outside of the sanctuary uh, for worship can be really enlivening for families. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, blessings on, on your next Sunday. Any other thoughts, Alan? Yes. Um, when I was growing up, children, young people, adults, were just regularly part of our worship service and nobody thought look at us we're being intergenerational it was church so that's just what we did and um, more recently in in my teaching career I, i've come to realize how segmented so many congregations are that so many people have grown up so many of the students with whom i interact it's on the one hand my temptation is to say you haven't been a part of a church you've been a part of this church program followed by this church program 
followed by that one and that one and that one. And you've never interacted with anybody in a church setting outside of your own age group. And a lot of those folks have been a part of really big churches, far larger than anything I've been a part of. Mm -hmm. I'm not um, speaking in speaking approvingly of that practice, but I do think those folks need to hear a compelling argument for church as an intergenerational experience. They, they need to hear um, something that will draw them, that will be persuasive, so that they will not simply view it as, in the short term, we'll get big, what will kids do after they graduate from youth programs? Who knows? But we'll be big now. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I frankly, I don't have a. I mean, I can make my case, but it's not compelling mm -hmm. to those who see the numbers. And that's what I'm looking for right now is something that will be helpful to folks that let's think longer term here than just um, your next week's attendance figures. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, I think that is so critical. And it's one of the reasons that I wanted to take the planning team to the Intergenerate Conference so that we could begin. I mean, it's the one conference that really focuses totally on intergenerational ministry so that we can begin to make that argument uh, in what we're producing from this grant. Um, so thank you so much for bringing that up. And I apologize for continuing to like leave the picture, but my dog has decided that this is the hour to start pulling everything out. And so she had just gotten a hold of this uh, package of flour and I was imagining <laughs> flower all over the living room here. So anyway, that is why I had to leave. Uh, I closed then, the door so that the other would not be able to get in here. Other people are responsible for the dog. Right, right. Well, she usually stays in the back room, but uh, she was barking at the beginning of this. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'll just let her roam. But uh, she's discovering all kinds of things that are within her reach at the moment. So, um, Vaughn, I'm going to uh, call on you and then Russell, and then we'll probably be, need to, oh, and then Eileen, and then we'll need to be wrapping things up. So we only have five minutes left of this session. But Vaughn. I'm wondering if, if any thought has been given to the use of appropriate technology to include, engage children in worship. Yeah, that's, that certainly is a, is a great um, question. I think Kalia um, might want to respond to that because you already brought up the digital aspect yeah. that you're... So that's going to be a big part of um, the grant piece is us imagining what does the technology need to be. Um, I think there's right now initial conversations had a lot to do with, you know, utilizing mobile devices that are available. And then how are you able to have mobile devices, talk to other devices in the space? The limitation that I have um, already kind of raised a thought to is when you start thinking about different congregational sizes and the different capacity for technology that will definitely um, create a divide on who's able to do what. But I think there will be a lot of learning that I know we're going to devote a lot of learning toward it because a big part of the conversations when we started thinking about the integration of the arts came out to be the digital arts. And then just this understanding of how our children now are really immersed in a technical world. And so we've got to be able to include that because it's what they're doing at home also. And so how do we begin to bring that forward? So there will be some findings that will come out of that for sure. And what I'm hoping is that we'll be able to find, have a way that we can talk to different congregational sizes to help think through different ways of integrating technology appropriately. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for that question. 
Thank you. Russell? Well, uh, thank you, Kathy and uh, Leah and Clea. Just with that, I would like to say adults are living in a digital culture. We've been immersed in it, even people as old as me, <laughs> you know, and so we know how to use that and that's how we engage the world. And, uh, you know, maybe is yet another way that we can help congregations understand that it is not a concession, these methods of engaging children in worship, but it's the way it helps us all engage worship in really ways that go back uh, in time to, uh, you know, the pre-print days, uh, more and more research from childish Bible scholars, uh, you know, looking back at uh, in the Hebrew Bible and in the Gospels that children were full participants, right? We know this with the Passover services. We know they were disciples. They weren't just metaphorical disciples. They were disciples in the Gospels and, and partic full participants, if you really read without an adultist perspective uh, with the Bible. And so uh, I think that's just one of many different clues of, of how we engage it. And it doesn't even have to be presented as sort of a concession for the kids. You know, we know you won't like this, but hey, many of the adults are ready to engage through through digital media. Now, I know we're up on time, so I'll I'll just end my thoughts there. Thank, thank you so much, Russell. And before I call on Eileen, I did put my um, email address in the chat in case you all have things that, um, you want to discuss um, I will do beyond the time that we have here, and Kalia is going to do the same. And there's also um, a feedback form to fill out when we finish. But Eileen, bring us home with uh, the last question of the night. I'll be quick. Um, when we're introducing, uh, having the children contribute arts and creativity to the worship environment and worship events, do they witness that adults are doing arts and creativity too? Mm. Or is it a children only thing that they will eventually grow out of? Yeah, and that's, I think, you know, for our grant, why we're really interested in the intergenerational aspect of worship so that it's everybody uh, participating. Um, I'll let Kalia speak since that was an arts related question too. But. So the hope is we'll get to the place where the children will witness that the adults are participating with them and not necessarily sitting back and spectating as they are doing something that's nice for the moment. And in the doing with, there becomes a relational connection that's able to be carried forward. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for this hour. It's been very rich. And if you have any advice for either one of us um, in, in launching these next five years, uh, we invite you to be in conversation with us. So thank you all so much. Thank you.